Hi, I'm James Lang, the co-founder of Vorpal Board, uh, which is a system for playing all your tabletop games online with friends using the actual board and pieces. And we're going to be talking today about uh, our system, and I'm going to give you a little demonstration. Awesome. Thanks, James. Yeah, no problem. So um, Mike and I are both connected into Vorpal Board right now. Uh, we have active video and audio chat, which is actually built into the website itself. Um, everything you see is just a website. All you need is a browser. And then I have a physical copy of Pandemic here to my left. And you can see that we have a video feed of the board happening. Um, additionally, we have some cards that have already been scanned into the system. But we'll talk about that in a second. So let's focus on the board. Um, the, the neat thing about what Vorpal Board can do is when it's streaming video, it also allows you to put your mouse over the board and get a very, very high resolution still image of the board itself, which is getting updated on a regular uh, cadence. So you get the benefit of being able to see video. So you can see me moving the pieces around and feel like you're watching. But then if you need to actually, in Pandemic's case, take a look at a city name, you can hover your mouse over and you can actually read the board text. This is what we call hybrid video. Um, we have two different ways that we stream boards in Vorpal Board. The first is hybrid video, which you're looking at now. And the other is just purely photos. And the idea behind streaming the photos is we can stream really, really, really high resolution, even more than this. But it comes across at maybe like one or two frames per second. And, um, and we'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Great. And then the, the other big piece is the cards. So all the cards that are built into the system um, are getting scanned in using a, 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 a scanner. Um, and when they get scanned in, they come in as interactable elements that Mike or I can move around and we can see each other moving them. They can be rotated, they can be changed in size, they can be flipped over so that you can't see them anymore. They can be picked up and added to my personal hand so that I can see them, but Mike cannot. All the things that you would expect a card or a game component to be able to do on a real table, we're trying to emulate it in our, in our virtual table. Now, you're using that scanner box with uh, another phone, uh, am I correct? Yeah, that's correct. So we have, in the setup that you're looking at right now, we have two smartphones in play. Um, we have a smartphone that's mounted over the table. So we're actually using this device that's streaming the video is my Android device. And then we have a smartphone that is sitting in our scanning box. And it uses the camera on the smartphone to recognize and scan in cards and automatically cut them out so that they're nicely cropped and that they look good. Um, that actually is a perfect time for me to just go ahead and scan a card. And we can, we can show that guy pop in. Um, and, and our goal is to make it so that for the host, the, the effort is not, um, is not a huge amount. I never hit the start scanning button. Every time, whenever I'm showing something somebody, I always forget to hit the start scanning button. All right, so um, the effort is to make it so for the host, it's very easy, right? So I just picked up that Bogota card. I put it on the scanner. It appeared in the game session. I could give this to Mike. Um, we could trade it. We could uh, give it to other remote players. I could add it to my hand. Uh, and in practice, the scans take maybe like a second to a second and a half per card. So I just put another one in there, and it popped into the game. Um, they come in face down. And that is, again, in the name of secrecy. So since it's face down, if I were to pick it up right now, I can see that it's Lima. Mike can't tell that it's Lima. Um, so that's how we, this game, it doesn't really matter because it's pandemic. But if we were playing a game where it did matter, that's how it would work. Great, great. Um, so, and, and you mentioned something before about being able to pre-scan in all the cards in advance and basically store them within your game session. Yeah, that's correct. So um, for a game that you, it has a lot of components um, that don't or don't need to be scanned live, right? So if it's just, hey, I need some counters, or I need the little first player token, or each of us has a set deck of cards that we both use, and it doesn't change throughout the game session, all of that can be done in advance and saved. And then when we connect, it's just all already in here. So we can play kind of both ways. If you need to do live scanning, you can. Or if you just pre-scan, the way that I use that a lot is in Gloomhaven, if you've ever played that. Um, everyone has their, their set 10, 12 cards, um, depending on what items they've found and what, um, what skills they've unlocked. And all that can be scanned in advance. Um, and the nice thing is we save it for future sessions as well. So 
Um, I only have to do that one time, and then I can play as many times as I need to with those components. Right on. Now, you mentioned something about uh, counters. Uh, so you can scan other bits and pieces of a uh, board game? Yeah, good, good question. So originally, we just did cards. So we just did kind of rectangular shapes. And then um, we realized that we wanted to be able to have everything, circles, uh, fire, like whatever. Games come in lots of different sizes. Uh, it's not just cards, obviously. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick quick scan here of a, of a smaller component um, and that just came in and and there it is it's a little I'm gonna zoom in oh well Mike you'd have to zoom in on it to show I suppose on your yeah, end but um, but yeah it's a it's just the little vial component that that came with um, with pandemic in, in the same way we can scan other stuff in um, uh, there's a game called horrified that has a lot of very different standee shapes and sizes and uh, and the system can scan in and automatically detect the edges and then cut the piece out and then present it to you. So even if it's a very complicated shape, it does a good job of detecting those edges and, and stitching it out. Um, so very that's nice. how that works. Very yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that gives you the opportunity to clutter up the table just like you do in real life, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sometimes. So uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is you can copy elements, right? So if, if it's something that has sort of like a bank, where you're pulling out tokens from the bank. We obviously don't want to have to be scanning in every <laughs> single one of those. Um, so you have the ability to copy them very easily. So I'm actually just going to copy this this token a couple times. And now I have like multiple versions of it. Um, so if it is, say, pulling money tokens or something, you can just have the four denominations of the money token. And then the players can go and, and sort of self-serve and grab their stuff as if they're sitting there. And then when they're done, they can just hit the delete button and it'll zoom off into oblivion now can you specify how many copies you want so it's like you know the game has like 30 of these potion tokens can you just go doo -doo, 30 uh currently no so so the way that normally when i'm doing a big copy i end up like copying one three times then multi-selecting because you can multi-select and ah, then copying okay. and, and then sort of essentially propagating by 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 multi-selecting and and that's how I do more. Um, but it, it, it's possible that in the future we would allow sort of a copy X because uh, we have run into that in the past, like especially with cubes and every player has 16 cubes to start or something. Right. It's a little bit of a pain to, to copy one at a time. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned something about using the photo method for the board. Uh, so I, I do notice that with the, with the current like live video, uh, it is. Um, it isn't as crisp as it could be. Yep. Could you switch it over to the yeah. uh, the video one so that we can see that? Let's switch. Okay. So we switched from what we call hybrid video to just a straight photo stream. I'm going to make this just about the same size you had it before, Mike, on your screen. Okay. And uh, and so now this is streaming photos, you know, maybe every once every second. Um, and when we zoom in on this, we can very very clearly read. Um, yes, it's very the, sharp. The uh, and so like we we give the the user the option there. I just put my hand in just so you'd sort of see what it looks like when I have my hand. It's a little bit behind, obviously, because we're we're streaming it at like a one frame per second type thing. Um, but we give the host the option. So if I'm the host. I can specify if I want to use video, hybrid video mode, or if I want to use photo mode. There's two main reasons for it. Once, one is bandwidth consideration. So if you're in a place that doesn't have very good internet um, and there's just really not good internet available, you're going to be able to do photo mode um, and not have to worry about having another video connection in play, which helps with your bandwidth usage. And then the other is game specific. There are certain games that you really do want to see people's hands moving around on the screen because um, otherwise it's a little bit jarring. And then there are certain games when that doesn't matter at all. And Pandemic, I think the way we play it most of the time is with photo only mode. Um, Pandemic has a lot of people using their pointers to make plans. And then once the plan is decided upon, uh, you know, the local player makes the changes and then the photos are just updated. It's more valuable, I think, for Pandemic to be able to really, really read the cities very clearly. So that's that's the two different modes. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and yeah, I mean, I 
I can't think of anything any 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 game that would really desperately need the video mode over this mode um, just because you're you're pretty much looking at a static thing but I guess it's it's nice to just know to get that immediate feedback gratification uh, of video so um, yeah, like a, the the one that we kind of see sometimes is if there's a play, any game where there's going to be a player who's flipping over a card from a deck, mm. that everybody should see it at the same time. And otherwise, you kind of have one player see it and sort of celebrate, and the other player waits a second before they see it and then they celebrate <laughs> it. Um, so, so uh, just top of my head, one that we play all the time in video mode or in hybrid video mode is um, code names, mm. uh, so that the remote players can see real time when the local player puts down that spy color to see if they were right or wrong. Um, and that's nice, that that makes it feel like you're sitting uh, at the table a little bit more. But yeah, a lot of games work totally fine with photo only mode. Awesome. How many, uh, how many different kinds of games have you uh, been able to play with this system so far? A lot, so so we, we tried to kickstart this product um, like eight months ago, eight, nine months ago. Um, and, and we almost made it, we didn't make it quite yet, and so we're launching again. But what that allowed us to do is spend a lot of time uh, turning the screw a little bit on, on tightening up the application uh, so it wasn't as much in a beta form, but also just trialing a ton of games and seeing where it started to fall apart. And that drove a lot of our development. And the way that we did that is we implemented kind of like a weekly team stream on Twitch where we would just try to play something live and if it failed, it failed. Um, and so I don't know, I'd say we've maybe in that period of time played 50 or 60 titles, anything from worker placement to party games to um, sort of dungeon crawler co-op style stuff. We've done some role playing games and that's really fun. Um, we've done some app-driven games. So we played Lord of the Rings, Journeys in Middle Earth, and that works well. Mm -hmm. um, and we've played um, a lot of Gloomhaven. That's probably the one I've played the most on here. Um, and then we found some mechanics that are not quite perfect. Um, the biggest one I'd say off the top of my head, besides dexterity mechanics, which you're not going to be able to do, right. is um, uh, uh, games where a remote player needs to reach into another player's deck and look at cards inside that deck and then maybe do something with them. Um, and, and the trick there is that if, if I'm re searching through someone's deck and stealing the first type of this card I find or something, to do that between the virtual and the physical is tricky. And we're working on coming up with some options um, that would make it so the virtual player could steal without the local player knowing what they stole. Um, but that, that particular mechanic is a tough one. Beyond that, we've been able to kind of overcome pretty much everything with some sort of technological solution. Um, you know, it's not always as fluid as sitting at the table because you're never going to be perfect. But, um, but by, by the time we play the game, we always sort of finish and we have a little decompression at the end and we say, did we have fun? Did everyone have fun playing this type of game? And sort of the goal is to make sure that everybody's like, yeah, that was actually really cool. So, um, so it's been... That's been very invaluable for us as a team, I'd say. So yeah, actually, um, you talking about that that mechanic that you're trying to you know, that you're working on some options for. Um, I just it, it just occurred to me. Uh, you said you've been playing a lot of Gloomhaven with it. Um, I know that there's a mechanic in Gloomhaven where if you do a, a short rest, you have to randomly discard one of your the cards from your hand. Yep. Um, do you have like, I guess, if if a remote player has their hand in front of them, um, is there like a, sh a shuffle operation that they can do before they, so that they can randomly draw that card? Otherwise, so, I would say they would probably know which card was which, and they'd be like, oh, yeah. let's get rid of that one. So currently, no. There will be when we have deck support into the system. Currently, no. But um, but the way that we handle it is they'll turn them all over and one of the other players will point to their card for them as to which one they lose. Uh, so so essentially we, we and, and that actually creates a little bit of tension because you'll say, damn it, why did you choose my, you know, move four, heal two or whatever, you know? Um, but that's how we generally do randomization um, 
Uh, also, James, sometimes it's people... a co-op game, not a PVP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, um, sometimes we'll have. So let's say you're playing a game with me, and I'm I'm the remote player in your local, and I get to choose one of your cards to to discard. The way that we do that is we have the local player take their cards and hold them under the camera and then the remote player uses their mouse to say i want you to discard this ah, one okay. and then and then they take it and they throw it away right so um and and that that it it also works really nice if you're using video because then it proves that we actually make the person take it out to prove they're <laughs> discarding the card that they yeah. said um when you're playing this way with the local remote thing it does open up a lot of interesting opportunities for people to cheat so just make sure you're doing this with uh with people you trust <laughs> <laughs> nice um so while you were talking earlier i was fiddling around with some of the controls that you have down here in the bottom right and one of them was game components and i hit that and yep like a few things popped up yes um, i guess let let's uh tell me about each of these these uh these actions Sure. Uh, action buttons down here. So some of these are kind of debug hard. style things, and some of them are, are things that we would assume would be in the final product. But going from the left to right, we have like the ability to toggle IDs. And so there are games where it's important that we can bridge the physical cards to the virtual cards and know which card is which. So if I scan in a card for you, there are certain games where I need to be able to steal that card from you easily. And if I need to steal a card from you, and I'm local, I need to know which of the cards I've scanned in are which of the cards in the virtual space. And the way that we do that is every time a card is scanned in, it gets an ID. And if you turn IDs on, you can see, if you click on a card, what its ID is. And if I'm going to steal the card from you, I need you to tell me what ID I stole, and I can pick it up off a sheet of paper here um, to know, oh, I stole card number three from you. That's what the toggle IDs is. Um, the components, this is just a debug thing for the moment. But the system will ship with a library of standard shapes, colors, and functions. Um, so if you need to add, say, I want to add a red cube, you can do so without having to scan it in. And we're just going to call those game components. The ones that you clicked, I think it brought in a red heart with a counter on it and a blue star with a counter on it. Yep, health and, and, uh, health and experience in Gloomhaven. Yeah, exactly. Health and experience in Gloomhaven. Um, but that's the idea is you'd be able to bring in counters, um, you'd be able to bring in uh, shapes and colors specific to your what player you are or whatever. Just so in games that have um, more standard size stuff, you know, discs or cubes or whatever, you don't have to scan those items in. You can scan those items in, but it'll be easier to just bring in components in this way. Um, the next one is refocus cameras. So when you're in photo mode, every once in a while, the camera, we're dealing with a cell phone here, we're dealing with lots of manufacturers, Sometimes their autofocus routines leave it so stuff's out of focus on the screen. Mm -hmm. If that happens, you can click this button, which tells all the cameras that are connected to the session to run their autofocus routines. And so that will clean up any sort of blurriness. The zoom extents button, you can pan your, your view around. You can zoom it in and out using the mouse scroll wheel. So if you click zoom extents, that just brings you back to a sane zoom level um, to make sure you can see everything. And then lock boards, the way that that works is if I click the lock boards, if I use my mouse and I left click, I can't move the board anymore. And the reason we have that functionality in there is once the board gets in place and everybody likes where it is, we don't want anybody to be actually accidentally able to move it. So we, essentially once we get everything locked in place, we say, okay, everybody lock boards. And, uh, and then at this point, the board is locked in place. It can't move around the table anymore. Um, and everybody can get their view the way they like. So uh, that's lock boards. Um, zoom tool, if you turn it defaults to on, but if you turn it off, you won't get the automatic zoom when you move your mm -hmm. mouse over stuff. And then the last one is broadcast mouse. So um, if you turn broadcast mouse off, I won't see where your mouse pointer is anymore. Yeah. And that's important for um, maybe like asymmetric hidden enemy games where one person's hidden and the other people aren't. And you don't want people to know where you're looking. <laughs> so you don't want other people to be able to see where your mouse is. Uh, so we give the opportunity to turn it off if, if you don't need that. Cool. And then up in the uh, the top left corner, you have, uh, I guess, a, a dice bucket. 
Yeah. Um, so, so the way that dice work, um, the ones that we have set up in here today are your kind of standard tabletop uh, RPG set of dice. So if you click that die button, it will open your dice drawer, and then you can add any dice that you want to use to your game, um, or you could just add them all, uh, which I did on my end. And then you get them visible now to you on this kind of toolbar, and you can specify how many you'd want to roll, uh, and then you can just fire them off. Um, and the neat thing about the dice is they're, I just rolled some, so you should see them on your end. Um, they're fully 3D rendered, they're lit. <laughs> I just rolled they, some too. Yeah, some weird, a weird combo there. Um, yeah. And so they're color coordinated, so you can tell who it is that's rolling the dice. And then we keep track of recent rolls over on the left-hand side, so you can look back at what the history was. Oh, nice. um, the standards that we have in here are just your kind of tried and true set. Um, but the, we also have the ability, and we're in the midst of transitioning this over into the 3D realm, to have custom uh, dice creation. So if you're playing Zombie Side you can make the D6s look like they look in zombie side. So a little skull on one side for the zombie head and then a Molotov cocktail for the six, right? Um, and we have that all working in 2D. Our dice used to be totally 2D, but one of those things that we got to clean up by having an extra eight months to work on the product was switching our dice into 3D. Um, and so we're in, the, in sort of the transition of getting it over. But the D6s, you'll be able to kind of set up your own D6s that are specific to the game. Um, top of my head, the game Root, has a weird D6. It's not actually one through six. It's like two ones, two twos, and a blank and a three or something like that. Um, and so you need the ability to customize the dice, and that's supported inside the system. Nice, nice. Um, so it looks like you've built a really robust, uh, I guess, video conferencing tool that is has special tools and special considerations for tabletop games. Um, I know your Kickstarter has a hardware component, um, I, I, or have some hardware components. Uh, tell us a little more about those. Yeah, so the Kickstarter um, will have an arm to mount the phone. So one of the things we found in our initial working with this, because this really started as like a labor of love type thing. This didn't start as an intent to make it a product. It was like, I'm bored. I would love to play board games with people who didn't live near me. Let me see if I can rig something up to make it work. And so we did a lot of searching for like an arm that would work the way we wanted to. And we didn't find a good option. So we've kind of designed an arm out of some components uh, to make it so um, we're happy with how it performs. So the arm is really long, for one oh, thing, nice. here. Um, and then it, it just holds a cell phone. It can rotate um, pretty much at any axis. So it can it can... And you're going to see a little like it, it rotates this way. It'll rotate this way. So you can do things like getting neat kind of um, almost like 30 degree views of the board if you need to. If you're playing something with miniatures, that's kind of nice sometimes. Mm -hmm. You guys are going to get a good view of like the inside of my basement here. Um, <laughs> and then the, the other thing that it can do is it goes really, 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 really high in comparison to anything you'd be able to kind of just find off the shelf. Um, and this lets you potentially play games that have a huge table uh, size. Like if you want to play, um, I don't think anybody's ever played Twilight Imperium, um, <laughs> but if you wanted to play like Arkham Horror, say, and it has just this really big long board, you need to have a lot of height. So or like arm, Talisman with all the expansions. Exactly, exactly, that's exactly <laughs> right. So that's the arm, um, and that would be part of the Kickstarter to mount the phone. And then the other piece that's part of the Kickstarter, we talked about it a little bit earlier, is the, the scanning box itself. So I'm going to hold up the box. And the, the scanning box is, is pretty straightforward. Um, let me turn off the light. It's got a light on the inside that comes out. It just has a little puck light, which Velcros into the back of the box. And it's made out of... Um, uh, really nice wood. It's laser cut wood. All of these, all these designs are, are laser cut on the sides and on the front. And then all you do is you open it up and you put your card on the glass right here, kind of like a desktop scanner. And when you close it, the cell phone, which is sitting in here, can detect the card and put it into the session. It comes apart and folds down to be very small. Um, so it flattens out these nice. walls. They're, they're hinged with leather and everything flattens out so it can fit in a box. Mainly because we don't want you to have to have it, you know, keep it on your desk all the time. We like the way it looks, but I nobody wants to keep stuff on their desk all the time. Um, and so included in the Kickstarter is this uh, card scanning box, the arm, and then two 
Uh, free months of hosting access. So the, the big question that everybody asks is like, okay, well, how are you going to monetize this thing? It's not just going to be a hardware product. Um, and the answer is that hosts would pay a monthly fee. Uh, remote players are free. So if I'm the host and I want to play Gloomhaven with you, I would pay a monthly fee to, to start game sessions and I could have as many people as I want join those game sessions. There's no gating of features. Uh, you just pay your monthly fee and, that, and that's it. The intent is that the monthly fee would be somewhere in the vicinity of $5 a month or $50 a year kind of is our breakdown. Um, so as a host, you could split that up between your team or your party if you wanted to. You can do whatever you want, but one person would need to have a host access on the system. Very nice. Um, and yeah, and you, you mentioned... You can continue, Mike. It's bugging me. I'm going to line this up a little bit. Oh. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned something about uh, there being a, a, a lifetime pledge... Uh, yeah, that's right. We are going to do as part of the Kickstarter. Uh, excuse me, as part of the Kickstarter, we're, we are going to have um, a Kickstarter exclusive lifetime option. And so the the tiers there will only be two, um, and tier one is seventy five dollars, and that includes the arm, the box, and two months of service. Tier two is the lifetime version, which includes the arm, the box. Uh, a lifetime subscription, so you'd never pay a subscription fee. And then you have the ability to actually customize the box a little bit. Um, right now, the back of the box says Kickstarter edition on it. And if you are on a lifetime tier, you'll be able to put your own, whatever you want it to say on the back, if you want to customize it. Um, right. And those are, those are gonna be the two tiers. Uh, in the first Kickstarter, we saw about 50-50 split between people on the lower level and then the lifetime. So we're, we're kind of anticipating that we'll be around there this time as well. Now, um, I, I'm sure a lot of people are, are, have already started doing this, but I bet they're comparing this to something like a tabletop simulator. Um, I noticed one of the things, that, one of the places, one of the ways this differs greatly is that it allows you to use your own physical product uh, and I think one of the gripes that I've had about digital product versus physical product uh, is a owning the physical product is a huge part of this hobby, right? And uh, there's something just immensely satisfying about that tactile uh, ability of like having the pieces, um, painting your minis, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whereas Tabletop Simulator, you have to basically rebuy every game, uh, and it has to be something that was developed specifically for Tabletop Simulator. Um, I'm sure they have ways of easily, uh, tools for easily converting some things, but, um, like, you know, just as a for instance, D&D Beyond, uh, I, I have to pay for the digital books and the physical books separately, uh, and it would be cool to to be able to say, hey, I have a physical copy of this book and verify it and then have it kind of show up, right? Right, yeah. Um, now, I know you're able to store cards and, and components with a game session, um, but are you thinking about, you know, a lot of people are going to be playing the same games on this tool, are you thinking about making libraries available or templates uh, for uh, board setup and that sort of thing? Yeah, good question. Um, so for now, anything that you scan is totally only yours. That, that, that's, a, that's the way that this is all gonna start. If you scan stuff in, it's saved to your local device. We don't actually even save it um, on the server side, mainly because we're just sort of being hyper vigilant about the idea of storing anybody else's intellectual property we're giving no one the ability to play any of these games without owning the game. Um, that's our goal, is if you own the game, you can play the game. Now, going into the future, we've talked with publishers about the idea of having some of their components already in the system at highest quality, so you don't have to scan some of them in. A perfect example is the attack modifier decks in Gloomhaven. You can't just play the game with just the attack mod modifier decks in Gloomhaven, right? right? You, you still need all the other stuff, uh, which you can't scan in. So would it be possible for us to work with Cephalofair and say, hey, could we have the attack modifier cards already in here in a, as a deck? We would love to get there, and that's something that we're going to try to do kind of post 
launch is work with publishers, figure out how to get some of their content already pre-built. Um, our hope is that it would be, hey, I bought the copy of the game, I can just go and download it. I, I have not talked far enough through with those folks as to how they would want to license it or if they would want to allow it or not allow it. Um, uh, so so that, that I guess it's a little bit, as far as the assets are concerned, we're not, we're not making the assets available across people at this time. Now, right. your next question, as far as like layouts and stuff, that is a direction that we want to go where if I'm playing Pandemic, there might be a layout that says, here's the best practice. You put your common cards up here. You, everyone puts their hands in these different four zones. And essentially we use them as like snapping points. So mm -hmm. it's very easy to organize all the components on screen. You made a mention of it earlier that you can make this just as messy as a real table. And that is true. You know, it, Once you start scanning a lot of stuff in, God help you, you need to keep track of all this stuff, right? right. So um, what we do want to have, and we don't have to, we're not able to demo this today, is that if I, as a player, say I play Gloomhaven a lot, I'm going to set up my layout. And my layout is I put the cameras in these four places, and this is where I put the hands. And then I can save that and share my table layout. And then when other people play, they can load up that layout and more easily deal with all the cards and components. Um, so you don't have to worry about zooming them and scaling them yourself, that it just sort of automatically happens. Right. Um, so that is a direction that we definitely will be going. The The one about libraries, I would love to get to, but there's gonna be way more conversations that need to happen with publishers. Because we're just, I, one of the things that, I think Tabletop Simulator is awesome. One of the things that always has kind of made me feel a little bit weird about it is like people would just make mods and put them up there and it's unclear sometimes if the publisher is in on it or not in on it, and the publisher has to like police it to make sure that people aren't just putting their assets up there. So I would like to not be a system where that sort of stuff uh, is in question. No, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to arouse the ire of any lawyers for some of these folks. <laughs> um, and we want people to buy these board games. You right, know, like, exactly. Uh, you know, our goal is to sort of. I, I don't know about you, but me, I, I have like a, a, a whole dang closet and, and the closet is overflowed onto the floor here of games that I looked at and I was like, I literally have played that game one time. Yeah. Or, or sometimes zero times, right? Oh, um, I've got so many games over here that <laughs> I've never even played. I've, I've owned, I think I've owned a copy of Spartacus for about four years and I've tried nice. to bring it to the table like 10 times and it just hasn't happened yet. Uh, yep. And I remember trying that game at Gen Con and thinking it was amazing. And I just, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's my, it's my white whale. <laughs> yeah. And my, and my, my, my cycle was always, okay. Like around the holidays, I'd get together with my family and my brothers and I would like get a game session in and I'd always have these grand plans like, Oh, we're going to play this game that I never played before. But like, Time's a crunch, and then we end up playing something that we always played, some something quick or easy or whatever. And then it's like, well, maybe next year I'll be able to try that with you guys. But like now that we have this thing, um, I can just throw the throw the game out on the table and actually um, work through it, you know. And and we can play sessions of Lord of the Rings um, with my brother who lives in New Jersey uh, without having to be physically present, which has been for me kind of a game changer, uh, pun intended. <laughs> nice. I've actually been using that term quite a bit in our uh, our staff chat. Uh, yeah, people this, just ro so. people are giving you rolling eye emojis. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about it, the different types of games. Um, I know you started building this uh, because you wanted to play Gloomhaven with your friends after you moved. Um, it strikes me. And, and actually, what caught my eye about this was when Dwarven Forge uh, posted a link to a stream you guys did recently of a D and D game. Uh, it actually strikes me that RPGs uh, like this solves a lot of issues of playing RPGs remotely, especially if you want to incorporate that physical aspect, like terrain and miniatures. Um, what about? Um, I guess war games won't work because people kind of bring their own uh, minis to the table, so it would have to be something that's everything in everything in one box uh, for that. Uh, uh, I guess. Well, I guess maybe you eventually you could do something like that if 
uh, you enabled someone else to have a host and like they did their own. I don't know. That's that's a rabbit hole, man. That's a yeah. Rabbit hole. We've <laughs> we've talked about you know like having actual versions of your pieces from your squads in the virtual space and then moving them around in virtual on top of a camera mm -hmm. and then there's kind of like you're fusing digital and physical at the same time um but it it you're right i mean for those types of games for war games it's not optimal if 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 all the physical components aren't in the same place not yet now that doesn't mean we couldn't maybe come up with something that works in the future right um have you thought about adding additional like static cameras i guess you're bumping up against you know people having multiple devices at that point but like it seems to me like it would be really cool if you had if you were able to focus a camera like for instance going back to gloomhaven yep. um having like this is this is just kind of spitballing here but um having something like uh Oh, are you putting another camera angle on yeah, it? Yeah, I am. Oh, I am. look I'm at doing that. It. <laughs> You've already got it. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're actually you're actually you are on the cusp of hitting the way that we actually play Gloomhaven, which is we have one camera pointed at the Gloomhaven Helper iPad app, oh. and one camera pointed at the board. And so the local player is just free to use the Gloomhaven Helper app, which which deals with a lot of the maintaining of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the lo the remote players can see that getting updated. So yeah, so we have the ability to to add in X number of cameras. Um, we found sometimes some use for that, uh, and and maybe very very big board layouts would benefit, or right. the type of game where maybe you absolutely need a camera always trained on some small view, and then you have your larger view. So yeah, yeah. that that yeah, we we do we do do it um, today. Um, but we, you know, in practice, we haven't used it as much as maybe I thought we would when we first, uh, enabled it. Yeah. I guess that's some next level stuff for like really, really weird, complex games. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, but it's nice to know in, in, in our back pocket, we kind of have the ability to do some of these things because one of the things that we think about, right. Cause, and you hit on it a little bit is, you know, why not tabletop simulator? And like, that's a fair question. Um, but one of the things that we see as a use case for our product is like, you and me live close to each other, let's say. And every once in a while, we are able to get babysitters and make sure our work schedules line up. And we're able to sit down and play a session of Gloomhaven, right? And we love it. It's great. But then for six weeks, it's hard for us to get back together again, mm -hmm. right? And can we just make it so you can sit down at your computer every Friday night, even though you can't make it to my house, and 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 I can play the physical copy and you can kind of dial in. Um, and and the in order to do that, you do have to have kind of the ability to have a camera on the iPad. If you, if you want it to feel like how it is when you and I are sitting together, you do need to have multiple cameras trained on the things or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the thing is, is if, you, if you're going with a tabletop simulator solution, you kind of are buying into doing it that way. And that's right. the way you're always going to do it. There's no mixing of the physical sometimes gotcha. with the remote yeah. sometimes. And then the other big thing is that if I have two players here, and a lot of cases I do, I have my wife and I sitting here, and then we have one remote player, say my brother. Um, if we were doing Tabletop Simulator, both my wife and I would be sitting on computers in, in maybe different rooms, and my brother would be on a computer as well. And so that feeling of, of she and I sitting together is obliterated you know mm -hmm. like that that now is very much to me feels more video gamey which is totally fine if that's how you want to play board games i right. think great you play them however you can but um it doesn't light up the right uh neurons in my brain i think like moving the stuff around is important to me as a hobbyist mm -hmm. um and so this helps to retain that feeling yeah like uh, I know a lot of games have come out with digital versions like Carcassonne mm -hmm. and Scythe and that sort of thing. Um, and I've enjoyed playing those kind of in solo mode or, you know, versus people on online. But I generally don't like... If I have a physical copy of that game, I would generally just rather play the physical copy, no matter yep. what. Um, like, you know, like I, I, Scythe, one of my favorite games... Uh, the digital version of it is fantastic. It's incredibly well developed, but 
I if I'm playing it, it's because I'm. It's like late at night, and I'm, I'm I I really want to play scythe, but there's no one around me, and yep. so I'm I'm trying out different strategies that, and I'm basically I consider it training for the real thing, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, but yeah, it's like you know my physical copy. I've got the legendary box. I've got the metal coins. I've got all the goodies for it, and yeah, I want to use that. Yep. Um, yeah, and if you're a mini painter, right? Like mm -hmm. I have my um, not all my Gloomhaven minis painted, but but when we unlock new characters, I try to paint them when somebody starts them, right? And so, like I want to see that thing, you know, and I yeah. want my player to see what it looks like for their character, right? So it it is. Sometimes people look at this solution and they're like, "Man, this is overkill. This is crazy. Why would you build this thing to like and, and deal with all the pain of?" scanning the cards and figuring out how to do the video streams and kind of all that stuff. And my answer is like that this to me retains that, that feeling that actually makes me enjoy the hobby. Once mm -hmm. I start diving into totally digital, I just, I just always kind of ask myself like, why don't I just play like a video game with you? You right. know, like, a, cause usually exactly. a video game is better at that point because we can't see each other. We're just mm -hmm. doing audio chat or whatever. And, um, a you're taking everything. Board. You're taking everything that makes that experience unique and removing it. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, some games are compelling enough to where you can do that, but some games are compelling because you're sitting across the table from your your other players. Yeah, you know, just sort of trying to retain that feeling of like emotionally connecting with another person a little bit. Um, and and the way we normally play, and and it's a little bit different when I'm streaming. When I'm streaming, I kind of have the game here, and I have my cameras and stuff here, and mm -hmm. I need another monitor for the stream or whatever. But when like I play it just for my own personal plays, we take a laptop and put it on the table, and we're just like playing in our dining room, and we see who we're playing with just sort of sitting across the table from us, um, and it and it, it it's just like they're sitting over there. You know, we have the big video window, um, and they're pointing at their version of the board or whatever, um, and um, and it does. It does when we're done it's sort of like man it really was like he was just sitting there tonight you know yeah yeah no and and i, I mean it's like i I've, I've been trying to start up a uh a second season uh with my D, D group that i left behind in austin and uh i've been spending the last several months racking my brain trying to figure out how i'm going to facilitate this in the meantime um, I one of the Kickstart Dwarven Forge Kickstarters I backed has been like hitting my my porch, <laughs> right? And so I've got bins and bins of this awesome Dwarven Forge terrain, and I'm like, well, I, I'll, everybody's back in Texas, and I'm in Colorado, so like I didn't. I was gonna. I was looking at Roll Twenty and just like having to rebuild everything in Roll Twenty, like just the the admin the management of trying to do that like i would rather physically set up my dwarven forge territory and point a camera at it and this like i i was i was looking at so many different ways of facilitating that and and, and pointing different cameras and and figuring out how to facilitate different streams and this just completely solves that and I think uh, I think for that reason alone, this is going to be a huge hit with RPG players if it isn't already. Um, and I think uh, I, I feel like it's it would be a great tool for streaming too. I know you guys have been doing a lot of streams. Uh, have you been talking to any streamers, any like uh, prominent streamers about using this tool? Yeah, so we are interacting and trying to build some relationships on Twitch uh, with people who stream board games and and role playing games. It, to stream board games is actually really difficult today. So the people that are out there are having to cobble together a tool to do their video chat, a tool to do their camera stuff, a tool to use the actual streaming software. Um, and it's just kind of complicated. You kind of have to be like a arcane wizard to get it all set up. And um, so in talking with them, we feel like we've just nullified a lot of the tools that they need to use. They could just use this for their video and their and their boards. Um, and then the zooming in and all that sort of stuff, which is difficult to do today. So we're hopeful that we can make it so people can stream board games more easily. And maybe that will fuel sort of a rise in board game streams. On the D&D &D side, there's lots of really cool um, role-playing game streams that are out there. 
And we're working with building like relationships with those folks. Um, and people have already seen kind of our stream. We do a, a D and D stream every Wednesday, every other Wednesday, excuse me. Um, and seen what we're able to do and, and people have already started to reach out and say, Hey, can we get our hands on like a beta to start using it for my own streaming purposes? Because today, like a lot of the times they either are in roll 20 and they've had to take the effort to sort of build everything in roll 20, or, um, they're just doing theater of the mind, six people kind of sitting in a room two shot, uh, with the DM and the players. Mm -hmm. And those are entertaining, but it would be really cool for them to also kind of have the battle map view where they show the really close Dwarven Forge stuff or whatever, you know, terrain or scenery they're using um, and sort of do that at the same time as having the six heads there. Um, so, yeah, I think we hope that that will be a real avenue for just normal people to want to stream their games or to stream board games more uh, than they are today. Nice. Uh, have you considered about, I know, I know there's like, ways for OBS to link up directly to Twitch and, and other streaming channels. Are you thinking about uh, adding kind of direct, more direct hooks into this for something like that eventually? That's a good question. We, we actually have, I haven't done much research into it from a technology perspective, but I know that like the, the API to sort of work through Twitch from chat into whatever's running is pretty robust. Um, and We've talked about, okay, could we make it so chat would actually kind of have the ability to zoom where they want to see things maybe? Because mm -hmm. one of the things that like when you're playing and you're streaming, you need to kind of be a director. You need right. to like move the mouse to where the interesting things are happening, right? Which mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to do when you're trying to play at the same time. <laughs> um, so, so it would be cool. We've talked about the possibility of letting chat control some stuff in their uh, view of the game. But we haven't started doing anything with it yet. We we are looking at just at least putting like the D and D Beyond. There's a D and D Beyond plugin that sits right, on top that of the extension. Stream. Yeah, yeah. And so we're probably going to have that in place for our D and D stream. But that has nothing really to do with Vorpal. Right. Um, so so we're we're downstream. Yes, currently no. I guess is the answer. No, that's fair. That's fair. I I, I imagine a lot of people uh, after they've tried this, they've had a bunch of their own ideas that they've thrown thrown at you too. Uh, I think I think what really appeals to me about this is the agnostic nature of the tool. Like you don't have to you don't have to have like buy a game a, a digital version of the game for playing this. You you're using yours. You it's just basically there to facilitate and um and it and it pretty much just gets out of the way where it can. Uh, to help yeah. help you play. Um, yeah, we've tried to make the user interface as like minimal as we can get away with so that the focus is more kind of on like what the components are. We're, we've talked about doing some theming to make, you know, a green background or a red felt or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, little tweaks. But our goal is to just sort of get out of the way. Yeah. Uh, be a tool that's built for tabletop gaming and web conferencing that you can run in really bad internet conditions. So if you're in living in Idaho and you have bad internet or whatever, right? Um, rural areas of the country generally don't have great availability of internet. So we're trying to make it so we use as minimal as possible and then let you still be able to kind of have a good time playing your games. Um, and, and, and that, you know, there isn't a product that does that right now. So that's how we, that's how yeah. we ended up where we are. Yeah, no. Uh, this this uh, this looks like it really hits a sweet spot, and and uh, it, if people find out about it, I can't see it not not taken off. Um, the Kickstarter launches Tuesday. Launches Tuesday, January twenty first. It'll run for thirty days, um, and you can you can find out more details about it at vorpalboard dot com or at our Twitter, which is just vorpalboard or at our Facebook, which is just Vorpal Board, or at our YouTube, which is just Vorpal Board. Pretty much we're everywhere. Um, but the, the campaign will start on Tuesday. We have some cool giveaways that we're planning to do during the campaign. Um, there are going to be some giveaways as part of our D&D stream that we partnered with uh, with folks like Dwarven Forge and D&D Beyond to give away some stuff during the streams. Oh, nice. And then we're going to give away some custom versions of the scanning box. So the scanning box um, built specifically for games that has like nice art for that particular game on the side of it. Um, so using some some really cool assets from existing board games. The first one that we've already announced that we're gonna run during the first part of the campaign is a unmatched 
uh, which is a game by restora- uh, a board game by Restoration Games. Mm-hmm. We're going to give away an unmatched version of the box um, during the campaign. So oh, nice. um, you'll be able to find out more, more about that on our Twitter feed. So very nice. yeah, we're very, very nice. excited. And uh, and Mike, I tell you what, we I, I, I agree with you that if people knew about it, uh, they'd like it. You know, I think it's the, the hardest thing is just sort of getting attention in the board game and tabletop gaming space, especially on Kickstarter. It's such a, a crowded field. So we're hoping that we're coming this second time to have a lot better existing crowd, bringing our own crowd instead of kind of trusting that Kicks, Kickstarter would supply the crowd for us. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, I, I, if I was going to say anything to our viewers out there, just go go back this thing because I, <laughs> I want to see it. I want to use it. Um, so uh, thanks a lot, James. Thanks for taking the time to, to demo Vorpal Board and talk to us about uh, its features and um I, i'm i'm looking forward to the kickstarter thanks mike i really appreciate it man all right thank you